So uh, we're talking about uh, hormone receptor positive metastatic breast cancer and um, the therapeutic evolution of treatments for that disease. But before we launch into that, it's worth reminding ourselves that this was the original targeted therapy for advanced breast cancer. And one of the points I always make to our fellows is that back in the day, when we first started using anti-estrogen therapy, uh, anti-estrogen uh, therapy in breast cancer, and they figured out how to do ER testing, and you could say if the tumor was ER positive or ER negative, these were the wonder drugs of the era. 75% objective response rate to anti-estrogen therapy back in the early 1970s. So people say, well, how come we don't see responses like that anymore? And it's because almost everybody's already had some degree of anti-estrogen therapy. But back then, this was the chrysotinib and the abrutinib and all these other miracle drugs that you see with 80% response rates. That was where breast cancer was essentially 45 years ago. So that's a good problem to have because we've been able to move forward since then. And we know that a lot of things predicted sensitivity or relative resistance to endocrine treatment. The quantitative level of estrogen receptor measured in femtomoles per milligram back in the old ligand binding assay days. If you were strongly ER positive, nearly 100% of those patients responded. It was a small number of patients, I concede. And lower levels of estrogen receptor had a lower rate of objective response. And similarly, tumors that were both ER and PR positive had a higher likelihood of response than did tumors that were ER positive but PR negative. So we've known for a long time about certain biomarkers that might suggest benefit or not from antiestrogen therapy. But of course, what's happened in the ensuing four decades is that we've moved these drugs that we used to use in the palliation of metastatic disease into the prevention of recurrence in the setting of early stage disease. So with time, uh, tamoxifen and then aromatase inhibitors and now uh, ovarian suppression have moved from treatments for palliative care, uh, treatment of advanced disease, into our standard armamentarium for pre- and postmenopausal women who have early stage breast cancer. And the result has been a steady decline since the early 1980s in mortality from ER positive breast cancer in all of the developed countries in the world. But we're still learning things about management of advanced breast cancer. And some of the questions that are on the table still have included things like, can we use dual anti-estrogen strategies to improve outcome? These are data from the SWOG0226 trial published a couple years ago in the New England Journal of Medicine looking at the aromatase inhibitor anastrozole as first-line therapy with or without fulvestrant, the uh, selective estrogen receptor degrader agent. Uh, in women with de novo or first-line treatment of metastatic disease. And I include this slide up here for a couple of points. The first is to say that many women with ER-positive breast cancer will do well. Median PFS here was about uh, 12 to 15 months. Uh, with the combination, it was 15 months. Um, but ultimately, almost all women progress within four or five years. And what we'd like to know more about is, can we optimize this, and what are the markers that suggest who's going to be a longer responder rather than a shorter one? We've also learned a lot about dosing, and one of the interesting things about a drug like fulvestrant is how difficult it proved to be to figure out the optimal dosing strategy. Um, Angela DeLeo uh, reported the confirmed trial that finally showed that 500 milligrams of fulvestrant was somewhat better than 250, and that became the standard uh, for treatment uh, of patients with uh, prior endocrine therapy. Um, now, when you take patients who've had prior endocrine therapy, you notice that the median PFS becomes soberingly short. And there's always been this interesting thing about all these studies in endocrine therapy. There's this early part of the curve where essentially, you know, something like 25 to 40 percent of the patients are just insensitive to hormone manipulation. And then there's this long slope. And we want to know more about both phases of those clinical curves. There's been interest in trying to define the optimal initial antiestrogen therapy. Uh, this was the so-called FIRST trial that looked at, uh, again, uh, patients who had not had prior therapy for metastatic disease, comparing fulvestrant at the higher dose versus anastrozole. Thank you for going backwards, but we wanted to go forwards. Um, and in longer-term follow-up, there was a PFS uh, advantage and even a survival advantage uh, with fulvestrant over anastrozole. And interestingly, last week, there was a press release uh, from AstraZeneca that the so-called Falcon study, which was also a comparison of fulvestrant versus anastrozole, suggested a, a clinical advantage perhaps for fulvestrant um, in those treatment-naive patients. Uh, we're looking forward to seeing those data at meetings in the future. So what accounts for resistance and what can we do to overcome that? So we, people have played with this for a long time, of course. And um, one of the things that's emerged 
uh, recently. And for those of you who didn't see it, I encourage you to go to the virtual meeting and look at Nick's discussion of this uh, from Friday afternoon. It was really brilliant, and he has been one of the laboratory leaders in this field. Renath Jesselson at uh, my institution at Dana-Farber has also made contributions here. And um, what's been interesting is that we've known for a long time that tumors usually retain expression of estrogen receptor. It's not that ER loss per se has been the contributor to resistance. But what we've learned only in the past couple of years is that with exposure to aromatase inhibitors in particular, tumors acquire a mutation in the estrogen receptor. This is not present at the baseline or the new diagnosis of de novo or early stage disease, but it's something that is acquired in the course of therapy with an aromatase inhibitor and is detectable in what was initially estimated to be about 15 to 20 percent and now looks to be, based on Nick's data and others, more like 30 to 40 percent of aromatase inhibitor treated patients. And these mutations are activating mutations. So they are in the ligand binding domain principally, and they drive constitutive activity of estrogen receptor, even in the, sen even in the setting of either tamoxifen blockade or of uh, estrogen deprivation through an aromatase inhibitor. And this observation has been remarkable because uh, it has allowed us to both understand, and in the next few months there will be commercial assays that will allow us to measure this directly in the bloodstream using cell-free DNA uh, sequencing. So this is a mutational profile that, similar to the in instance of EGFR mutations in lung cancer, you're probably going to start following in real time in your patients in the months ahead. Other strategies to look at resistance to endocrine therapy have included uh, using combination of combinatorial pathways. So there's been a lot of interest in breast cancer in targeting the p 3 kinase, AKT, and mTOR pathway. The um, Human Genome Atlas suggests that this is one of the most common mutations in tumors uh, that are ER-positive breast cancer. Roughly 30 to 40 percent of all breast cancers will have p 3 kinase mutations. After p53 loss, it's one of the most common mutations in all of breast cancer. And so it has seemed that there must be a way to clinically take advantage of this. There have been some limited successes here amongst patients who were relatively treatment refractory who went on to the so-called Bolero 2 trial, a Novartis-led study that looked at exemestane with or without everolimus. There was clinical benefit for everolimus and improvement in progression-free survival from around three months to seven months and some responses. Having said that, this uh, and, and a similar principle was shown in the so-called TAMRAD study, which was a randomized phase two study of tamoxifen with or without everolimus. Uh, in this instance, again, an improvement in progression-free survival and actually in, in this small study, an improvement in overall survival as well. So perhaps going after multiple pathways at the same time is one effective strategy for overcoming some resistance to endocrine therapy. Well, I want to spend the rest of my remarks uh, uh, thinking about CDK inhibition and the cell cycle. Uh, many of us have had to go back to our medical school textbooks to remind ourselves of what this cycle was, but you may recall that the cyclin-dependent kinases are regulators of the progression through the cell cycle in particular at the G1 cell cycle uh, checkpoint. So you got that question right. Don't get it wrong on the post-test here, okay? Um, and we know that cyclins like CDK4 uh, interact with cyclin D1, excuse me, cyclin D, and that the normal physiology is that CDK4 phosphorylates RB, which then comes off of this complex and allows cyclin D to go ahead and do its thing uh, into the cell cycle. And if you block CDK4 uh, phosphorylation of RB, you get G1 cell cycle arrest. And so people have known this for actually a long time. In fact, uh, there have been studies going back 10 or 15 years looking at relatively weak CDK inhibitors such as flavopyridol, which we actually had in phase one at Dana-Farber and never really did much. Um, but that's really changed with the commercial development of three highly selective CDK4-6 inhibitors. Uh, you're familiar with them, abemacyclib, uh, palbacyclib, which is now commercially available, and ribocyclib. Now, if you write down one thing the entire evening, I want you to write down the organic structures of each one of these molecules. <laughs> remember where the nitrogen groups are. I don't want to give away anything about the final part of the exam this evening, but just remember where the nitrogen components are. So what's impressive about these drugs is that they have nanomolar activity against CDK4 and CDK6. You'll notice that there are some uh, differences in their uh, uh, activity, and so I think one of the things we're going to ask Nick and Maura to talk about later is whether CDK4 targeting versus CDK6 targeting is going to be more potent. There are also people who are interested in CDK9 as part of this complex, and perhaps there's some activity there with abemacyclib. So these drugs are not all the same, 
and you've written down their organic structures because there's going to be a test at the end of this. And now we have a little video, which we're going to play. I did not make the video. In order to better understand the biology of the signaling pathways and how they relate to the mechanism of action of CDK4-6 inhibitors, we have prepared some animation that illustrate these points. One approach to treating advanced estrogen receptor positive breast cancer is by targeting the cell cycle. In a healthy cell, the cell cycle is well controlled. However, in a cancer cell, the cell cycle is deregulated from mutations or upstream signals, causing cancer cells to proliferate at faster rates than healthy cells. For example, in estrogen receptor positive breast cancer cells, the deregulation of the cell cycle is caused by the overexpression and overactivation of growth factor and estrogen receptor pathways. When these pathways become activated, they instigate a cascade of mitogenic signals. A wide variety of mitogenic signaling pathways converge at the level of cyclin D1 messenger RNA and protein upregulation. Cyclin D1 binds to and activates cell cycle dependent protein kinases, or CDK, 4 and 6. The activated cyclin D1 CDK4-6 complex mediates the phosphorylation and inactivation of the tumor suppressor retinoblastoma protein. In a normal state, activated RB protein inhibits the cell cycle from progressing through the G1 phase. The phosphorylation of the RB or retinoblastoma protein releases E2F transcription factors from the protein complex causing the cell cycle to progress from G1 to S phase and resulting in cancer cell proliferation. There are three selective ATP competitive inhibitors that have been developed to target the cyclin D1 CDK4-6 complex. These small molecule inhibitors block the cyclin D1 CDK4-6 complex and prevent the phosphorylation of RB protein. This stops the cell cycle from progressing to the S phase, preventing cell cancer proliferation or growth. In addition to causing transient G1 cell cycle arrest, preclinical evidence suggests that these inhibitors can also cause senescence and apoptosis. Targeting the cell cycle with CDK4-6 inhibitors is a promising treatment option for patients with hormone receptor positive breast cancer. Great. And you know that those were breast cancer cells because they were pink. So that was uh, good. So this works in vivo. Uh, these are data uh, a few years old now. This is not from a breast cancer model, but on exposure uh, in vitro uh, to palbociclib, you see uh, uh, loss of uh, RB phosphorylation, and you see a decrease in key 67 or a surrogate measure of cell proliferation. And so um, Rich Finn at UCLA uh, was one of the first to work with palbociclib. Um, and looked at a bank of uh, tumor cell lines and found that in particularly ER-positive breast cancer cell lines that uh, palbociclib would inhibit proliferation. Um, and so the luminal subset of breast cancers became the target for commercial development as it turned out of all three of these agents. But what's interesting is that um, there also were HER2-positive cell lines that were inhibited in this model. And um, uh, there's been a lot of interest in the interactions between the HER2 pathway and the um, uh, uh, cyclin-dependent kinase pathway. And I mentioned some data that were just published a, a couple of months ago by Sham Goyal, uh, one of our junior faculty at Dana-Farber, a really beautiful paper in Cancer Cell, where they looked at uh, in vivo uh, models of tumor growth in mice and looked at a model of HER2 resistance and expression and showed, and I apologize, this probably wasn't uh, uh, well enough done, but it showed that uh, tumors that recur uh, in a HER2 uh, positive fashion and resistant, uh, often overexpress cyclin D1 and CDK. And that in the animal models, if you added a bemocyclib, one of the CDK4-6 inhibitors, to trastuzumab or lapatinib-based therapy, you actually saw inhibition of growth. And so we actually are developing clinical trials not built around ER positive signaling, which is going to be the thrust of the discussion for the rest of the evening, but around HER2 positive signaling. And what's interesting about this class of drugs uh, is that while the first label indication has been in breast cancer, uh, there will probably be other malignancies where these will be uh, useful uh, uh, treatments. So there are a variety of mechanisms that contribute to endocrine resistance. There are preclinical models that suggest that there might be uh, pathway interactions that are important. And this is also being taken the next direction by other investigators who are looking 
at um, going back to that PI3 kinase pathway, the mTOR pathway, and trying to combine uh, CDK4-6 inhibitors, anti-estrogen strategies, and PI3 kinase-targeted drugs. So there's a lot of interest brewing about this class of drugs.